Today, we received another outstanding jobs report. 528,000 jobs were added. Today, I'm signing the law of the Chips and Science Act, a once-in-a-generation investment. And today, we take another important step toward bringing Sweden and Finland into NATO. This is the most significant law our nation has ever had passed to help millions of veterans who are exposed to toxic substances during their military services. President Biden celebrating a recent string of legislative and political victories. Let's bring in the roundtable, New York Times political correspondent Alex Burns, former DNC chair Donna Brazil, Sarah Isger, veteran of the Trump Justice Department and now an ABC News analyst, and Washington Post syndicated columnist Dana Milbank, author of the new book, The Deconstructionist, the 25-year crack-up of the Republican Party. Deconstructionist. What did I say? Construction? De De Deconstructionist. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, destructionist. Okay. Okay. I'm with you, uh, Alex. Uh, let me let me just ask you. You're, you're talking you, to to Republicans on the Hill. It was notable the way they all came out uh, to attack uh, the the FBI and the Justice Department, defend Donald Trump after the raid on on Monday. But I haven't heard much over you know since we've seen the warrant. What, 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 what is going on? Uh, where are we going to see Kevin McCarthy and the others go? Look, I think there's a real sense at this point that, you know, this wasn't just a political stunt by the Justice Department, but, you know, maybe you don't want to go too far out on the limb of defending uh, President Trump before you know uh, the real details of what's going on here. At the same time, there's no appetite uh, in the Republican Party to uh, denounce Donald Trump or to sort of get ahead of the game as they see it and sort of presume that he probably did something inappropriate. I think your interview with Governor Hogan uh, just now is really quite revealing, right, that one of the most strenuous critics of Donald Trump within the party uh, basically taking a wait-and-see approach. And what you're hearing across the board from Republicans, I think you'll continue to hear this uh, from Republicans, is just sort of differing tones of demands for more information, right? There's the outrage demand for more information that uh, surely the Justice Department is probably full of it and they need to give us more information uh, versus the Larry Hogan sort of more measured, you know, I, I sure would like to have more of the facts here, but that's basically the spectrum of responses you're going to get. Donna, I mean, obviously some of this defund the FBI thing, I mean, is, is, is over the top. But, but are you concerned about the, the, the way the country is divided on something like this? You see, you know, these, these, these impassioned supporters of Donald Trump uh, making these, these allegations about our legal, about our, our law enforcement. Uh, what concerns me, as you well know, is the threats, the threats to law enforcement. You had to defund the police, now defund the FBI. Who's condemning that when a small minority of Democratic lawmakers and others, activists said, defund the police, everybody was outraged. How dare you? Well, how dare you threaten the highest uh, order in our country, the FBI? And the Republicans are mainly solid. Um, here it is, a country that is right now border, and it is, the violence is, is out there, the threats out there, just like the threats was out there leading up to January 6th. So it's time to pull back, it's time to respect the rule of law, it's time to let all of the information, all of the investigation, and you know, as I was flying back home, you know, when you, you're flying back home, you want to cruise, and, and I'm coming from Africa, from Kenya, their elections. The last one was nullify. And, and we were preaching over there, be calm, be patient. And here I'm flying back to the turbulence. Yeah. It is just mm -hmm. outrageous that when I saw Republican lawmakers, leaders of their party out there basically targeting law enforcement for doing their job. And the president, yeah. the former president, let's start calling him the former president. <laughs> Yeah. Stop calling him the president. He's the former president. Is acting and behaving like a toddler. The, the, the defeated former president. Uh, but, but Sarah, you, you are a former spokesperson for the RNC, you know, pre-Trump. Pre um, how, how, long, how much longer will the, the party apparatus, the party leader, kind of leaders, basically defend Trump without knowing what is there? Oh, I don't think that that's in question at this point. You have to put it in the larger context of the primaries that we've seen lately. You know, when Donald Trump has gone up against Mike Pence, Ted Cruz, other like leaders, people who want to run for president, 
Uh, it hasn't been 100 percent. But by and large, you have to say that Donald Trump has won those primaries. You know, I think it's interesting because actually the test should be whether those candidates then can win in a general election with general election voters, not just the Republican base. But these folks are concerned about the Republican base. And the Republican base is standing with Donald Trump. He has solidified his support through the spring and summer, undoubtedly. And this was icing on that support cake. You're not going to see Republicans come out and say, well, this was the straw. I guess we're going to turn against Trump. You but, didn't but, see but, it on but, January not, 6th, and you're not going to see it now. But I'm not asking that. I'm asking the, the, the kind of immediate knee-jerk, defend him at all costs. Welcome to partisan politics, John. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right. think about I mean, what about our emails? Do Democrats now believe that, that mishandling of classified information is as serious as we should all think mm -hmm. it is? We should think it's serious when Hillary does it, when uh, you know she had seven top secret emails on uh, conversations on her server. She had declassifying authority. We should have thought that was serious. We should think this is serious. This but is no, it's different, partisan. though. I, I, think think what yeah. I think what Democrats will acknowledge in private, they won't say it in public, they won't say that these are equivalent cases, and they're not equivalent cases they're based not. on the information yeah, we not. have. But what Democrats will acknowledge in private is that it was a mistake to turn a blind eye to the political ramifications of that story for as long as they did, mm -hmm. and it's a lesson that uh, Republicans might uh, take today. Right? Well, when you're out that defending Bill something... and Me Too stuff recently, too. Yeah, well, how about you? Oh, Dana, you're, you're dying to jump in here. I, I, I am dying to jump in here. <laughs> Look, uh, this has been a horrific week in the sense of the, the threat to the rule of law. I mean, Republicans, with their violent talk, actual violence, have lit a bonfire yes. under the threat of the rule of law. Uh, earlier, uh, Governor Hogan was saying he thinks this week was a win for Donald Trump. I think it's exactly the opposite. We can talk about them motivating Donald Trump's base. Guess what? They were already motivated. Mm -hmm. But what's happening now is they are putting Donald Donald Trump on the ballot uh, because of the way the Republicans have all uh, grasped around him, the way they're going to knock out nine of ten of the House mm -hmm. Republicans who voted for impeachment uh, because of the Dobbs decision, because of the January 6 hearings. More and more, the midterm elections are looking less like a referendum on the Biden administration, more like, do you want MAGA back? And I think that is going to be the long-term uh, takeaway from this week. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm sorry for mangling the title of your book and saying deconstructionist, but they are kind of, I mean, there's a war on the truth. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, you know, it's destructionist is the point, but 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 there is kind of like the truth doesn't matter. It it we have reached that point where the truth doesn't matter. I argue that it started 25 years ago. We remember Vince mm -hmm. uh, Vince Foster's so-called murder, but now we're talking about. I mean, come on, that the, that the the FBI had a court-ordered search and it's a raid, and the FBI is planting evidence. I mean, we're uh, we're in the twilight zone. What about this, Sarah? This this argument that uh, that John Solomon put forward uh, uh, one of the president's allies, one of the people designated to deal with the archives on his behalf, that the president had a standing policy uh, that anything he took out of the Oval Office was declassified. <laughs> anything yeah. he touched. First of all, legally, that's just interesting to debate on its own. But set aside the legality of it. Let's talk practically. So every time the president went to Mar-a-Lago, which he went to frequently, no matter how serious the conversation, the topic was, everything became declassified, which meant it could be turned over to the public immediately. I simply don't believe that a U.S. Right. president would do that. When he walks out with his mill aid with a nuclear football. But regardless also, the current president can <laughs> reclassify. So yes. a sitting president has classification and declassification authority, limited by Congress, by the way. Right. The Atomic Energy Act limits the president's power. I've heard no serious constitutional argument why that's not valid. Uh, so, and, but again, it gets into this weeds that... You thought it was serious when Hillary Clinton did it on her server. The argument that there were secret service guards there didn't make any difference because the server was attached to the Internet. We don't know what these documents were. We don't know who had access to those rooms in Mar-a-Lago. And we don't know what efforts the Department of Justice I made mean, post subpoena to get those documents I mean, just back. the tonnage of it is kind of amazing, isn't it? Yes. I mean, 27 boxes, not all of it classified, obviously, but... <clears throat> This is after he already said, oh, I forgot, you know, I, this is the stuff I was supposed to turn over. I mean, this is a lot of stuff. Right. I, never, I didn't know Donald Trump was like a, was a hoarder. Or what, maybe, what, what is this? And, and it is one of the things that when you talk to Republicans, particularly the last few days, I think there's the initial response of a sort of shock and defensiveness around the FBI uh, searching Mar-a-Lago. But every successive day, the former president and his legal team, such as it is, have uh, been out there making these arguments that, as Sarah was just saying, are just uh, sort of... Uh, 
you know, stretch the bounds of credulity on Catch their Catch up against face, the wall, if right? you know. uh, And if you're <laughs> a, a politician in a competitive race today, or an ambitious politician who expects to be in a competitive race down the line, you know, again, how far do you want to go out on the limb well, with a set of people who seem to be making it And you've it already up as they gone go? out that far. Right. Now, everything in those 15 boxes, whether it's nuclear secrets, whether it's dirt on the president of France, you've basically said, uh, this is okay. I'm standing with Donald Trump. Uh, the FBI needs to be destroyed. Uh, they're declaring war on you, uh, the Donald Trump supporter. But also acknowledge that if it's not those things, you have opened a Pandora's box into searching Joe Biden's house for evidence of Hunter's cocaine use in, you know, two years, five years, whatever that may I be. I mean, this appears to be something entirely beyond that, but... Uh, I mean, we may not know. I mean, the very nature right. of this is it's classified material. So I don't but, know if that... But, but so it might be nice if everyone speculated do know, less. And, and, you know, I've been reading a lot of your coverage, and thank you for doing such an excellent job. But it looks as though the archivists, they were not planning to go to Disneyland. They really had a mission to go and retrieve documents. And someone signed, uh, a Trump lawyer, that everything had been provided back to the government, yeah. and yet it wasn't. So... Why is it that this former president believed that he's above the law, he's above the rules, he can break any norms and still get away with it? This is an opportunity for us to learn as, a, as Americans that no one, do no you, one is do, above the law. Do you feel, law. though, Donna, that almost like we fell into a vortex here this past week and we, we emerged in 2017 again <laughs> and all the stories are about Donald Trump? I mean, this has yeah. got to be frustrating to the Biden White House. You can't, you know, you can't get through. I mean, he, he has had a string of... Significant victories. I would say that over the last 30 days, the president has once again hit his stride and that, you know, this, this ability to focus on the long term, to invest mm -hmm. in the American people, to really help ordinary Americans. This I think that is breaking through. It's going to break through. It's going to be slow. It's going to be like molasses, but not this, syrup, and but it's going to spread. This is exactly where the Biden folks want to be right now, right. making this election about Donald Trump. Look, going... Listen, not about his... String of all the stuff we heard, John. That, that will Trump take some about. of the air out of, uh, of of complaining about inflation. That inflation is better. There's a, a string of achievements, but we're seeing an extraordinary thing now in the momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, Democrats have gone from minus uh, two on the generic ballot, meaning they were behind, mm -hmm. to plus one in a midterm election. This momentum has never gone in that direction back since 1998 when they started counting it, when the incumbent president's party is actually gaining. Uh, so I think they're, they're actually gotten themselves, thanks to Donald Trump and the extreme reaction, into a place where they want to be combined with the And Sarah's right. Sarah's right. The fall is not just Democrats and Republicans. It's independents. And those swing voters will swing hard for the truth and for our future. Well, well, I mean, sir, you raised the point of these, you know, Trump has dominated these primaries, the Senate primaries, a number of these House primaries, and it will be a question, how do those candidates do in the fall? That's right. I mean, when we talk about the House, you know, I still think Democrats are going to lose the House. I don't think there's much argument around that, although things sure. could shift. Mm -hmm. But the Senate is where you're looking at this and thinking, my God, once again, will Republicans not win back the Senate when it's firmly in their power to do so. In 2020, Donald Trump lost those two seats in Georgia. And this time around, the Trump-endorsed candidates are just looking incredibly weaker than we expected them to look in Pennsylvania, in Georgia. I mean, if they don't win the, the Senate, it will be because of Donald Trump. At this point, absolutely. You have every bit of momentum on your side. The yeah, one thing is gas prices going down. Certainly that will help Democrats. But that alone, in a midterm election, with a president with a 40% or lower approval rating, should not be a losing message for Republicans. John, I remember having a conversation with uh, a prominent Democratic strategist after the 2012 election, when against the odds they gained seats. Uh, in the Senate, saying, you, know, you guys have had a couple, you know, above mm -hmm. uh, a beat, expectations beating uh, Senate campaigns, but, you know, you guys can't just run a cycle after cycle counting on the Republicans uh, to nominate a bunch of uh, extreme and... <laughs> 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 Here we are. We're 10 years yeah, later, yeah. Uh, and it's still <laughs> happening, right? And, right. and I, think, I think the point uh, that Sarah made about Trump, you know, he is affecting the cycle in so many ways, right? He's affecting it in a narrow way, in installing these Senate candidates, and we should add uh, gubernatorial candidates mm -hmm. who look terribly damaged and terribly outside the mainstream. And, are pulling and he's, down affecting the it, he's affecting it in a macro way, too, the way yeah. Dana is describing. Yeah. For, making and and remember, way. this is about electing election deniers. They, they have put forward people who don't believe in the credibility the of the help, last the election. Yeah. Look, only one case. In Here's couple. the good news. Yeah. Here's case. the good news. Democrats are Donna, being invigorated. Donna, unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you all. <laughs> Great roundtable.
Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.